So welcome everyone to streaming NLP infrastructure and data flow. So I'm um, going to do a few introductions, first of all, um, and then a little bit about what we're going to cover, and then we'll get on to the actual presentation. So who are, I, are we? Um, well, I'm Angus Nielsen. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm Alex. Uh, I have a background in data science and machine learning. Um, so I'm currently a machine learning engineer. Uh, working on uh, building up our ML ops uh, capabilities. Yeah, and uh, I'm the data engineer on the data platform at Trustpilot. Um, uh, as you can see, we've got, we had to put something interesting about ourselves. We both like whiskey. So if anyone wants any recommendations later, I'll happily chat to them at the bar. Um, anyway, so on to the presentation. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about who Trustpilot is so you can understand the importance of data to us. Um, spoiler alert, it's how we generate revenue. Um, I expect we're not alone in the room when doing that. Um, I'll give you an introduction to Trustpilot data platform and from there I'll speak about the infrastructure and how the Beam programming model was useful to us. Um, and then I'll hand over to Alex. Uh, yeah, I'll be speaking about our experiences operating uh, GPUs on day four for both our batch and streaming uh, ML pipelines. Uh, and I'll also be sharing some exciting uh, work we've been doing uh, using Beam in uh, our ML ops infrastructure. Yeah, that's really cool stuff. <laughs> um, anyway, so who are Trustpilot? Um, this is our mission. Um, quite ambitious, I suppose. Um, but that's where we're going, hopefully. Um, we have a reviews platform, a website essentially collects reviews from consumers about all kinds of e-commerce businesses. If you have an online presence, someone can review you on Trustpilot. Um, companies then can engage with that or not. Um, and that's obviously when we go there, um, uh, that's where we generate our revenue as well because we provide integrations. It's a freemium model, so anyone can use it. We have a website out there. You can make use of, of sort of limited services in Trustpilot, um, but obviously larger volumes and everything, then we're gonna, you're going to pay. Um, basically, we can create that positive feedback loop for customers. So they have a problem, you complain, we allow then replies, and in that process, perhaps you can resolve the problem, and as a result, your score can improve. Um, there's no other way of improving your score. There is no paid model or anything that will get you a better score in Trustpilot, you have to basically do the work and give customers better service. And obviously we've got um, growth in data, 21% um, increase in, in reviews last year. Um, and we are also trying to make sure the platform is as clean as possible, taking down fake reviews, combined AI and human process involved in doing that. Um, but as I say, 2.7 million fake reviews taken off the platform um, last year. So Trustpilot data platform. Um, so basically, we started on a journey. Uh, we had an old implementation of NLP, natural language processing, which was clearly something we want to do. We've got review text. Um, it was ECS Docker based. So we're not talking about ancient technology. Um, Trustpilot's pretty much always been a cloud based platform. Um, model was not as good as we would like it. Um, it only supported English language, um, which is a bit of a drawback. It was from originally founded in Denmark, so even our founding country, we couldn't do NLP pro and NLP um, on that. Um, the model was from the pre-transformer era, um, not that one. Um, if you can see the emoji, it's probably a little bit small here. But Optimus Prime was not involved. Um, and it also meant that obviously with the language problems, we weren't able to supply our products or some of our products to a significant portion of our customers. We also wanted to be able to improve the model more quickly um, and evolve our NLP capability as Alex will discuss later and ultimately add some other analytic capabilities, um, ideally making self-service for our contexts. Um, our data lake is where our data science teams work as well as in GCP. So again, this was kind of a, a natural fit. So our existing infrastructure, I'm not sure if I can get this pointer to work, how that works. Is that that, that here? Yeah. So oh, I don't know if I can do that anyway. But as you can see, we have infrastructure here. Um, our operational stores here, we use Kafka connectors. 
which then push into our Kafka cluster. Um, and then from here, we use Cloud Dataflow, which ingests our data in, into BigQuery. Um, this is um, kind of quite nice because we also have the option, for example, to use the batch model with the same NLP, sorry, not NLP job, sorry, <laughs> same data flow job um, here to uh, backfill if we have data that's older than 30 days for partitioning in BigQuery. Um, so that's quite a nice feature that we've been using. And this was in place before I even joined the company. I've been with Trustpilot a couple of years. Um, we ultimately, and again, other people using XKCD as well, but you kind of, I feel obliged to use this one. Um, we've all been there at times probably, these pipelines, and you want to ensure that you have some kind of much cleaner model, self-service. So we aspire to this data mesh ideal. Um, we're not there, there yet, but um, that's kind of our aspirations. Uh, Zamak Degani, the paper, if you haven't read it, it's worth going and reading. Um, again, it's the theory and practice. So we all know the difference between theory and practice. And you know, in theory, there's no difference. And in practice, there is. So um, we're trying to embrace it. Trustpilot, we have a kind of core concept already embraced in Trustpilot is the domain-based context. So there's all these different contexts within it. Um, and we're trying to manage that so that essentially the data flow of our data is not interrupted um, by the data platform. We don't get in the way. We're quite a small team at the moment, um, you know, recruiting, of course. Um, but we also have, for example, already implemented a, a pipeline in a pipeline system in Airflow where teams can build their own um, pipelines. We manage the Airflow and they can deploy ETL jobs um, predominantly on GCP. So they'll clean up um, provide aggregations on the data and then build their dashboards or whatever models or whatever they need to do. So, uh, so the new pipeline. So this was our plan. Uh, just to add extra data flow beam job that did the NLP processing uh, just in here. Um, and then again, push that back out to Kafka. Um, this is kind of where we needed our data for our products. Um, downstream of that Kafka, which I haven't put in there, is uh, Elastic or Open Search uh, instance that we wanted to populate with the, with the new data. Um, obviously, that makes sense for language based data. That's what we use for our back end um, for our API. Um, so that was the plan. Um, we wanted to run it in uh, Python instead of Java, which the other ones are in, because, um, and bad joke coming, that was a natural language of our data scientists. So <laughs> anyway, I have to put a bad joke in. Um, anyway, so it's never as simple as you think. Um, I may need to scroll that because I lose my notes. Um, the Kafka OI, IO lib, library that we were depending on um, was not quite as production ready for the um, Python. Um, and we had difficulty in scaling it and back pressure. Um, when we were using the P transforms from Beam and Python, we ran into a few challenges as well. Things like reading the Kafka metadata didn't seem to quite work as we wanted. Um, and other so tombstone messages. So they were um, basically that in Kafka, if you've worked with Kafka, tombstone message is a key plus a null. Um, but within the expansion service, it doesn't know how to translate a null to a byte. Um, so we ran into issues with that. That's been fixed. So there, and in fact, I was talking to, I don't know if he's in the audience, but the kind gentleman that has fixed it. <laughs> um, so, so that's good. And we may revisit some of that. Is it possible to scroll there? So, okay, thanks. Um, right. Um, other issues, um, interaction with the schema registry, we had some challenges with. Um, and then uh, we did look into the multi-language model, but we actually also run up against an issue with nulls there, serialization from Java to Python. So uh, anyway, at the time, and I appreciate things have moved on. So this was a, a journey and there are probably certain fixes in certain versions and things now, and we may revisit the multi-language model. Um, yeah, sorry, it's the next slide. Anyway, so our solution we came up with at the time was to add this, uh, basically a Kafka IO pub sub data flow job, which just pushed into pub sub. Um, and then we ran our Python based, uh, oops, our Python based, press the right button, 
here um, and then pushed back out to PubSub and then back out into Kafka. Um, the null issues we could handle because it was then wrapped in a PubSub message um, and we could handle some metadata flag, which then just passed the null back through. Again, to be clear, the, the reason we wanted to preserve the nulls is that a null represents a delete. So a delete we wanted to respect all the way through our pipelines, especially from the point of view of GDPR compliance. Um, if someone's deleted their review, then it stays deleted. Um, we didn't want it appearing again then somewhere else. So um, there were some downsides, a bit more infrastructure. Again, the infrastructure to manage, cost. Um, we also had two different queue semantics. Um, I'm going to go in detail on that. We could do an entire talk on, on uh, the joys of those things. And actually, we're talking about that. Obviously, the previous talk, the previous talk was was mentioning some of the, some of the things around that. Um, but basically, um, good news is um, we uh, we're in production with it. It's running. Um, so um, just to go into a few of the advantages we found using Beam. Um, Basically, obviously the streaming model and the unified model of, of Beam gives us an option to backfill as well. And this is, um, we, we utilized it initially, we actually had a batch job running, which was then able to fill an internal tool. Um, we found things like portable and local development is well supported, so that's nice. Um, we're already running Dataflow, so it's familiar tech to us. Open source, we like open source, of course. Um, custom metrics were great, uh, easy to add. There's a little example there. I mean, it's, it's kind of a two liner. Um, and then that's our example in a Grafana dashboard. It just pretty much there. Um, you know, if we've ever done metrics before and things, that's nice. And we do care about observability, and it's nice to be able to add observability on your data in a way that um, we can monitor for things like data quality. Um, our, uh, I was going to say, um, you know, our customers don't care about bytes or heap size or any of these things. They do care if they're getting their data. So you can start building metrics around that and observability. Something I'm quite keen about in, in our pipeline is to be observable with their data. Anyway, so simplified, um, basically, this is the streaming job, runs through the pipeline as such. Um, we then also, if we want to do a backfill, so if we've updated the model and we want to refresh our entire pipeline, uh, the green line going through there is um, backfill. And then we also have, um, and I think my key color key there is wrong. Anyway, <laughs> um, BigQuery um, running a batch job, which is backfilling our data into our data lake um, because we want the same data in data lake, for example, for the data scientists to evolve the model, evaluate the model, and even other teams perhaps to examine some of the things that we're producing um, as a byproduct of that. Um, so basically, we can maintain this. We also have, as I mentioned, I think earlier, the blue-green deployment, not that the color of the arrows has anything to do with that, but uh, essentially we can run two pipelines simultaneously, backfill our elastic index on the operational side, and then do a blue-green deployment. Um, if it looks bad, we can very quickly swap it back out because we're running both pipelines simultaneously. Um, and obviously then just switch the old one off once we're done. So that's it. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Alex. Um, hopefully he'll have better luck with leaving the pointy thing. <laughs> when we... um, yeah, so uh, thank you, Angus. And, uh, uh, I'd like to talk about our experiences operating uh, GPUs for machine learning inference pipelines on Dataflow. Um, so we do that for both uh, batch and streaming jobs. Um, later on, I'll also give an uh, introduction to model drift detection and how we're using beam pipelines to uh, calculate drift metrics. Um, so our ML inference workload in our pipelines uh, involves running a large multilingual uh, transformer model from Hugging Face. Uh, so we run this locally in the data flow pipeline workers. Um, so it made sense to provision uh, GPU resources to speed this up. Uh, so from both the time and cost perspective, uh, we made uh, orders of magnitude uh, in savings. Um, so 
our model translates uh, review text in any uh, natural language, so uh, Danish, uh, Dutch, German, English, into uh, numerical data that can be fed into uh, smaller models downstream to perform a host of uh, NLP tasks such as sentiment analysis and uh, topic modeling. Uh, so uh, once we've translated our text uh, into vectors, um, it makes our downstream ML tasks uh, much easier. So for example, uh, we can get a much greater degree of uh, linear separability uh, between the similar sentences, um, which is what this graph is showing. Um, and since we're also dealing with multiple uh, natural languages in our review text, um, we can embed these into a, a language agnostic uh, domain. Um, so this helps to unify all of our NLP, uh, all of our downstream NLP processing. Um, so um, taking advantage of the uh, beam batch and streaming unified model, um, we've got a single uh, pipeline for running both uh, real-time and batch jobs. Um, so for the streaming pipeline, we wanted to ensure a low latency of real-time inferences. And for the batch pipeline, uh, we needed to be able to support uh, new model releases quickly. Uh, so for us, this involved uh, running a batch job for each new release uh, to backfill historical data with new uh, model inferences. Um, so this was a particularly um, important capability for us uh, because we've made a lot of improvements in our um, and a lot to support data scientists to uh, scale and orchestrate their experiments. Um, we did this by adopting some of the machine learning design patterns uh, that Lack talked about in his keynote yesterday. Um, so in particular, uh, we defined our machine learning experiments with uh, TensorFlow extended pipelines, uh, which is another great uh, Beam project. Um, so with the increased velocity of uh, experimentation and uh, model releases, uh, we wanted to make sure that our data pipeline was not the um, uh, back, uh, bottleneck. Um, uh, so there are two ways to get machine learning inferences inside a uh, beam pipeline. We can either call uh, a remotely deployed API endpoint um, or we can run uh, the model locally inside the pipeline itself. Um, so there is a trade-off uh, between both. And uh, although we did explore uh, using uh, managed services such as Vertex endpoints, uh, that can come at a, at a premium. So um, having the model loaded locally uh, inside Dataflow workers uh, was a happy medium for us. Um, so I hope that gave a bit of insight into what we're trying to achieve uh, with um, data flow and our um, ML uh, pipelines. So um, I'd now like to move on to some of the uh, common pitfalls we encountered um, operating uh, GPUs on data flow. Uh, so hopefully you'll find some of these uh, helpful if you want to uh, start using GPUs as well. Um, so when you get started, uh, with uh, GPUs, one of the first things you'll encounter is that there is a bit of a conflict between uh, certain kinds of parallelism uh, in beam pipelines, which disrupts uh, some of the expected behavior uh, during both model loading and initialization, and also model inference. Uh, so I'm going to step through um, each of these levels of uh, parallelism, which can cause uh, problems and how to go around them. Um, so when loading a model to GPU, um, you usually only want to load one copy of that model. Um, otherwise, you'll probably get a CUDA out of memory error. Um, so because of multi-threading in Beam pipelines, um, if, you, um, if you don't do something like this and use uh, the shared API um, and the shared handle uh, in Beam, um, then yeah, you'll, you'll get that error. Um, so the way to get around that is you pass this shared handle and that will uh, force the uh, do fun to load uh, 
uh, only one copy of that model uh, into uh, memory. Um, so inside our do fund, we uh, initialize uh, our model by invoking uh, acquire on the uh, shared handle um, with this function. Um, so on this flow, there's also another uh, type of parallelism to watch out for. Um, so this is at the fee CPU core level. Um, so this is because each uh, fee CPU worker in um, each fee CPU in the worker machine instance uh, starts its own Docker runtime. And you don't want each uh, Docker runtime to load uh, a new copy of the model uh, into memory. Um, so there are two ways you can get around this, and that is by using by setting um, the no use multiple SDK uh, containers uh, flag. And you can also use uh, specify a custom instance which uh, limits uh, the number of vCPUs to one. Um, the final trick uh, on model initialization that you might come across is um, something we encountered when we were loading uh, hugging face models. Um, so we found that unless we initialized uh, that model with a uh, sort of dummy inference, um, then that model would not actually load onto uh, the GPU. Um, so the way to get around that is just to run uh, an inference at the same time that you're loading the model. Um, and the final issue that you might come across when you're running uh, inferences uh, with your loaded model is um, where you have multiple threads trying to access the same model. Um, there's another simple trick to get around this, just use a threading lock uh, and you won't, uh, and you'll get back the predictions uh, that you're meant to. Um, so just to recap, um, running beam pipelines on uh, data flow can boost performance and also reduce costs. Um, there are just a few uh, pitfalls to watch out for. So uh, these are some of them. And, uh, yeah, uh, try, try them out. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, I'd now like to show you how we've used Beam pipelines as part of our MLOps uh, infrastructure and how we implemented uh, scalable uh, linear algebra operations inside, inside Beam uh, for calculating uh, drift detection. And how we also accelerated this with uh, GPU uh, devices uh, to get uh, speed up at several orders of magnitude. Um, so MLOps is the uh, practice of streamlining model development and deployment. Um, and the core part of MLOps depends on uh, monitoring and observability that are specific to ML models. Um, so for example, if you deploy an API endpoint, you probably care about uh, monitoring metrics such as uh, request and response latency, uh, request per second, um, and for REST API, uh, HTTP uh, status codes. But for machine learning models, um, there is an additional uh, dimension of monitoring that uh, we need to help ensure that our model, uh, deployed models are uh, performing as expected. Um, so signals on whether like model uh, input data and output uh, predictions are drifting uh, can help us to infer whether these models need to be retrained uh, by data scientists or even by an automatic process. Um, so I'll focus today on the problem of uh, model input data drift and how we use Beam to calculate these metrics. Uh, so here we have an example um, of uh, data points drawn from uh, two different processes. Uh, so the blue represents a process with a stationary distribution and the green represents a process whose uh, distribution, as you can see, varies at every step. So the problem of drift detection is uh, the task of calculating 
uh, a metric that can summarize the magnitude um, to which this green data set differs from uh, the blue. Um, so for example, in uh, a machine learning context, the blue data points could represent uh, the training data that the model saw at training time, and the green data points here could represent uh, some production data um, that a deployed model is seeing. So suppose that we trained a simple uh, linear regression model uh, on this data uh, to classify the two uh, blue clusters. Um, we would probably see a model function like this. Um, However, suppose if we uh, had, if we saw uh, this green data uh, during production time, then our model accuracy would actually uh, degrade um, as the green data uh, drifts away. So unless we directly calculate and monitor uh, statistics related to drift, uh, we don't really have an idea um, about how a model is performing, uh, particularly since we don't uh, have labels um, on our uh, predictions um, in production time. So yeah, what we would like is a metric that can uh, measure the degree of drift. Um, so one metric uh, that might be appropriate um, in in a machine learning context is called the uh, maximum mean discrepancy. Um, so this is a two sample test statistic. Uh, it works on multivariate data um, and it, we can use it to measure the pairwise distance between uh, data points in uh, two data sets. Um, we can take advantage of kernel methods so all we need to do is pick an appropriate kernel function that defines the distance between uh, two types of data. So, um, so sorry, between uh, two data points of the same type. Um, so there are kernel functions for strings, uh, graph data, image data, and tree data. Um, and just a final point here, uh, we can use uh, the maximum mean discrepancy also to evaluate um, uh, data coming out of generative models um, and compare them to real data. Um, so this is the same data that you saw uh, earlier. And what I've done here is calculated the maximum uh, mean uh, divergence um, between the green and the blue data. Um, and as the green data points move away from the blue data points, uh, what we can see is that the distance metric uh, shoots up and as the uh, green data points approximate uh, the blue, um, it goes back down to zero. Um, so I hope that gives a bit of motivation for um, why we want to calculate this uh, statistic um, and why this could be helpful as part of our um, ML ops monitoring. Um, so I now want to talk about some of the challenges that we face in calculating this metric um, on possibly millions or billions of data points and how we can actually use Beam to solve some of these problems. Um, so firstly, we have um, a lot of data um, and loading it all into memory uh, to compute pairwise distances um, would not be feasible. Uh, secondly, matrix operations are slow and can scale poorly. Um, so we benchmarked um, an SK learn implementation on a kernel function um, that we need to use to calculate the um, MMD. And uh, comparing a data set of uh, 1 million uh, data points to another data set of 1 million data points would take over uh, three and a half hours. Um, so we uh, Definitely want to uh, bring that down. Um, the final point, I, I won't talk about this today, but um, we also have the problem of uh, needing to conduct a hyperparameter uh, search to find uh, the settings for uh, our kernel function um, that can measure um, distance uh, 
appropriate to our data. Um, so um, on the challenge of the scale of data, we can take advantage of uh, BEAM's parallelism to implement uh, parallel linear algebra um, algorithms. So we can chunk um, our data set into smaller batches um, in this way. So this is an example of, very simple example of uh, chunking a uh, matrix uh, multiplication. And this is embarrassingly parallel, so it suits the uh, beam paradigm very well. And this is what it looks like in, in a beam pipeline. So we just have um, so two uh, inputs from BigQuery, and we just batch them. And then further down the pipeline, we have a bit of uh, clever indexing so that, we can, so that we can map the appropriate row batch to the appropriate column batch. Um, and then we do a group by key um, on these indices. And after that, we can do our matrix operation. Uh, yeah. So uh, the second challenge, uh, which I mentioned, is that uh, those matrix operations, even if we uh, chunk them down, um, can scale poorly. Um, so what we would like uh, is to use this uh, RBF kernel function um, however, as I mentioned earlier, this sklearn implementation would take um, three and a half hours uh, to compute. Um, so what we want to do is to use JAX. Um, so JAX is a, uh, a numerical computation library uh, for Python, and it allows us to compile uh, linear algebra vector matrix operations to an intermediate representation uh, that we can then uh, run on dispatch to run on GPUs and TPUs. Um, we can think of it as a drop-in replacement uh, for NumPy, and I'll show you how um, easy that is to do later. Um, yeah, so also includes auto differentiation for native Python functions. So it does make it an excellent package for uh, scientific computing. And I'm going to show you how we uh, used JAX to uh, help scale our drift detection uh, calculations. So um, I'd like to show you what uh, JAX code looks like compared to NumPy code. Um, so uh, this function, we're computing the uh, pairwise Euclidean distance uh, between uh, data points in a matrix X and data points in a matrix Y. And this is what the uh, JAX implementation looks like. Uh, so all we have to do is import uh, NumPy uh, from JAX. And all of the familiar uh, NumPy functions are available for us to use. Um, I want to draw your attention to the last line, uh, where uh, what we're doing here is compiling our um, own implementation. Um, and that allows us to dispatch uh, the running of this code to um, accelerators. accelerators. Um, so I want to demonstrate why this solves uh, the challenge I mentioned earlier of scaling uh, matrix operations. So here I have a benchmark uh, running a NumPy implementation, uh, comparing it to uh, the JAX implementation. And this takes, uh, the NumPy implementation will take over eight seconds. Uh, that compares to our uh, JIT compiled uh, JAX function, which runs in less than five milliseconds on GPU. So this is actually a speed up of over um, 1,700 times. And I should also mention that on uh, CPU, um, we still have a 30 time speed up. Um, so JAX is worth exploring, uh, even if you don't want to go down the route of um, using GPUs uh, for your uh, pipeline workers. Um, so here is just another benchmark for um, comparing um, the speed of the sklearn implementation to our own uh, JAX uh, JIT compiled one. 
uh, and as you can see, uh, several orders of magnitude faster. So, um, yeah, I, I guess just a quick note about uh, PMAP. So, um, on Dataflow, uh, we can provision uh, multiple GPUs per worker, and a really nice um, function in uh, JAX we have is we can um, easily use this to dispatch um, our operations to multiple uh, accelerator devices. Um, so how can we actually use uh, JAX inside um, a beam pipeline? Um, well, we have our uh, do fun here. Um, I've implemented um, my uh, JAX function, which calculates um, a distance metric. And this has to be a pure function, so that is without uh, control flow or side effects. And in my init uh, method, um, all I need to do is uh, JIT compile it. And then I can use it um, inside my process uh, function uh, to do matrix operations. Um, so this is what the full pipeline looks like. Um, we're reading in um, our, our reference uh, data set which represents our training data. And we want to compare or calculate the distance of that compared to um, some production data. So we're reading that in from BigQuery, batching it, indexing it, uh, and then running all of the matrix operations on GPU with JAX. Um, so this is what it looks like in terms of uh, compute wartime. So you can see um, all of the calculations that we're running uh, are pretty fast. And it's really the reading in uh, from IO that is the uh, bottleneck here. Um, so we computed the uh, MMD statistic uh, on uh, the past two years of our historical data. Um, so I should mention actually that where uh, doing this on the embeddings uh, data uh, themselves. Um, and this is what we found. Uh, so we did have an anomaly uh, April last year, uh, and this seemed to have been caused due to a spike in reviews for a Danish party company. Um, so, uh, yeah. So we can see also more recently in recent weeks um, that the drift score is trending upwards. Um, so that is something we're keeping an eye on. Um, so this is what um, it looks like as part of our uh, Grafana monitoring setup. Um, so in Grafana, we have a dashboard to monitor our uh, pipeline uh, infrastructure. Um, so we've included here um, standard data flow metrics, metrics from PubSub. And for, for the first time, we're now also able to include um, model monitoring metrics, um, which it opens up a new dimension of observability uh, for our models. Uh, so just a few next steps about uh, where we want to take this. Um, I think um, using statistical hypothesis testing to set a more print scientifically principled uh, threshold on the MMD score, um, perhaps exploring alternative um, lin parallel linear algebra algorithms, which might be more uh, compute and memory efficient. And what I've presented today is, is an example of um, offline drift detection. So we're comparing a static data set to a static data set. Um, I think the, the fact that uh, Beam offers this unified batch and streaming uh, mode uh, should allow us to very quickly get online drift up and running. Uh, yeah, so this is what we talked about today. Uh, some of our uh, Python and Kafka structure um, 
match and streaming. Um, I talked a little bit about our experiences operating GPUs on Dataflow, um, and also how we use Beam uh, to operate our statistical uh, drift detection. Uh, yeah, so that's it.